Well, it's really nice for me to be here at Living Web Farms on an April evening, an early April evening. The tree, obviously, the apple tree, in fact, it's a crab apple tree that we didn't particularly want to keep. And so a year ago, we grafted it, and I'm going to show you the grafts in a few minutes, but right now I want to trim this crab apple tree to keep part of it as crab apples, and I want to trim away the part that we don't want anymore before we get to the main point of what we're going to do, which is to braid together the grafts that I made a year ago. So first I'm going to be trimming this tree. I want to keep this limb because it's far enough away from the grafts and it's in a nice direction. So I've chosen it and I want to get its competition out of the way. And the competition <laughs> has a lot of bloom, but is not wanted. So, and this branch right here is way too large and too close to the graphs that we have. And in a moment, I'm going to show the graphs and point them out. All right, so this limb is going to be kept. I'm going to leave this one and this one. This is an insurance limb in case this one has something happen to it, like the deer eat it or break it. These flowers will pollinate the flowers of the grafted plant that we put on here a year ago. So we now have kept the part of this original crab apple tree that we want to have. And I've made it so that we can easily get to the grafts. This one I put two in, and this one I put two in, but one didn't grow. So we have one graft and another pair of grafts here. Actually, this, this one had two branches grow on it, the same as this, and then this was a separate graft put in on the other side over here. So I'm gonna get this one out of the way. Again, for the reason that we don't wanna have the whole crab apple, this side of the tree now is gonna be the pollinizer side of the tree for the future. And I'm going to remove a couple of more branches that we don't need on the crab apple. I kind of like this crab apple too. I think I'd have both of them. You're going to have both because we, we need the pollen from the crab apple to pollinate the graph. The major purpose of this evening's demonstration is that we wanted to show that when we have two grafts that took, actually, these two took, they were both put on here. They took, meaning the graft worked. We'll talk about why it worked in a moment. And then a bud down low. So we now have three branches here of our graft. And we have this other graft over here with two. And since we have three, it is possible when they start to have apples on them that it won't be strong enough right here that it might break. And so one of the ways to have the trunk be stronger is to actually braid them. If we pull this through and then this one through just like braiding hair, it's the little side limbs that are making this difficult. But those little side limbs are gonna have flowers on them next year, they're spurs and so I don't want to knock them off. I've broken the bark away, and, and I've broken the bark a little bit here as well, where it goes up through. And as the wind moves this, some more of these kinds of breaks in the bark are going to happen in the, each place where it crosses. And why is this important? Well, that's the key to why we can graft, and it's also the key to why these are going to graft together to make a single trunk. And the reason for that is the cambium, C-A-M-B-I-U-M, the cambium layer, which is a layer of cells between the bark and the wood, and that cambium layer is what makes rings in a tree that tells the age of the tree because the tree makes another set of bark to the outside every year and another set of wood to the inside. But when we let them rub together, the cambium on this side exchanges cells with the cambium on the, on the other side of the braid. And we have enough places where they're going to rub together that this whole thing that I have right here is going to be one trunk in the, in the future, and we'll come back to it in future years to have a look at it. Now, I, I'd like to re-emphasize that it, 
that this single layer of cells called the cambium that's between the wood and the bark is also very key to what we want what we did a, a year ago when we made this graft and the reason it's a key is going to be explained by my demonstrating how we made that graft i'm going to sacrifice this strong graft so we can put another graft on it this year of a different apple. And to do that, to sacrifice it, I'm just going to cut it off. Last year, this tree was about this big around and I cut it off like we did here. And now I'm gonna split it in half and make the beginning part of what's called a cleft graft. I have an heirloom golden apple, a summer golden apple that most farmsteads in this region would have used in past years to make the first applesauce of the season. By splitting this, I've made it possible that we can open it up and that I can put two pieces of this golden transparent type of apple in here, slide them in the side here so that their cambium layer touches the cambium layer of this. If I put it straight down in there, I'm less sure that I've touched two cambiums together. But if I angle it slightly, then surely someplace along the outside edge of this little twig, between its bark and the wood, there'll be a place that the cambium is, is touching. So I'm cutting another one to put in the other side, but before we do it, I'm going to show it. And so I made it so that it's, it's like an a ax or a hatchet in that it's sharp on this side and broader on that, this side. And between this wood in the middle and the bark, there's a layer of cambium, like the one we showed up in the top of this tree and I'm gonna slide this in, again, slightly angled, so that someplace along here, the cambium of the new variety is touching the cambium of this one. Now, if we left it just like this, it would fail, because it needs to be have, have wax or a, a paint that would fill this crack up in here and would fill the crack along here and would cover the top so that the transpiration and the living parts of the tree would not dry out this before the cells of this plant and the cells of the stick of wood that I put in start to intermingle with each other. It should be clear to people who are looking at this that I've lined up the cambium of the cyan or the new variety with the cambium of the rootstock. And actually now at this stage, we have the crab apple. We have the apple that we put in here last year. So we have a three part tree if this grows. Cambium is the key to the braiding. And the reason it's the key to the braiding is that we want the cambiums of the two limbs of the graph we made last year to rub into each other so that they can exchange cells between the different limbs as they go up through here. If we didn't think that there was enough friction happening to expose the cambium of both, we could make a slight incision in the, in the bark of this type. But I can see by looking at it that we probably have enough contact between the two uh, and that we won't need to, especially when the wind moves this, that it will cause rubbing that's going to cause the two cambiums to come in contact with each other. The reason we did the braiding is to make a stronger trunk that won't be so apt to blow out with a big wind when we have a big crop of apples on this tree. And the reason that I made this graft over again was just to demonstrate about the cambium and about the kind of graph that we made last year. And we want to use and keep part of the crab apple because we know that this crab apple will pollinate this apple variety. We have the, the necessary tools and equipment to finish this graft so that it might work. Some black electrical tape that I'm, I'm using to pull this split that I made 
tighter together and I'm leaving a little ring around the top so that the wax will sit inside of this ring. We have to come back since this is non-disintegrating electrical tape, we have to come back if this graft actually works and cut along the sides of the tape or it will strangle the, strangle the limb. But That'll be next year or will that be this year? It's later this year when we see if these are growing. We're ready to coat this inside here and we'll even coat outside of, of this in case I didn't get a good tight cover on it. So we're going to just try to fill that crack right up with wax. And I'm also trying to touch the sides of where I made the cut so that they're covered with wax as well. You're thinking, well, possibly you're coating the place of contact for the cambium. But the cambium is being pressed so hard by the pinch of the rootstock here that we split that we don't need to worry about that. Now, if we had used one stick and cut it in two, we would have an exposed surface on the piece that we put in that was cut in two, and then that's very essential that we would paint the top of that. But since these tips are buds, we don't need to worry, they're going to come out, and actually there's probably enough stored energy inside of the wood of these that these leaves, now that we've taken this wood out of the refrigerator, these leaves will start to grow, and this bud will start to grow, and we'll think, oh, well, the graft really worked. But actually, it's just using the stored energy at the beginning that's in this wood, and in two weeks' time, We'll see not only the leaves and the buds opening here, but we'll see that there's a slight increase already in the diameter starting to happen. And believe it or not, these little twigs, that if they did grow, next year would be as big as this because of the energy that's existing already in the roots of this tree. That energy is being pushed here and all the photosynthesis and things that are happening from the sunshine on the top and the, the nutrients and water that's taken up by the bottom will make these just explode in their growth if, if we had the good contact that we think we had here with the graft. I think we accomplished what we were hoping to do, Pat. The director of Living Web Farms is such a good friend of mine to let me come around here because what I'm learning is about what's under these tarps. I'm learning a lot about managing the organic composition of the soil and the place that the soil microbes are living. And Pat's a great teacher to help me learn about that. I, I went to college about soils, but at the time I went to college, they were not teaching about that. Now today, it, that subject does get taught. But Pat's making a lot of what beautiful compost here that's a combination uh, of... Um, well, it's a mix of um, cow manure, lots of corn stalks, and then garden weeds and stuff. And actually, even I am constantly learning. Last year, we started making it with lots of wood because we realized that our carbon was disappearing before the compost was finished, and that's the fungal food. Right. Uh, so we had to go to wood, which we'll have to screen back out if we want to put that below the soil. Oh, I assumed you were bringing charcoal over here from oh, your we're putting, other farm. We put charcoal in a little bit at first, but not too much because it doesn't have much activity. It'll kind of slow the process down. Uh -huh. So we put about 10 to 15 percent in to start, and then when we're done, we cut the finished product 50-50 with charcoal. It, the charcoal, that's one of the great things I've learned from Pat, is that there are real, literally tens of thousands of hotels for bacteria and fungus to live in those tiny, tiny pores, because uh, all that is, charcoal is, is carbon skeletons. Yep. And the, the carbon skeletons are where the microbes live that help the, help the plants grow in the soil. Yep. Thank, I'm loving learning about it, thanks. <laughs> I love that you love it. Um, <laughs> so what we could film up there is the pruning you would do to do more releasing because you wanted to prune more last year and she wasn't ready for it now she is good we would like to show and teach a class about how to make grafts on a tree like this to put other apple varieties on this tree and so we've had good success with some of the grafts that we put on this tree we put some here wherever you see the paint the orange paint and the tape that's on it the, the limb that's coming out from that is the graft, and that one over there is Grimes Golden, and the label for this one says it's Gold Rush. 
This one is my favorite, and it's my favorite because it's highly resistant to the diseases that we have here in, in the mountains of, of North Carolina, where it's quite warm and, and conducive with all of our rains and warm temperature to having both fungal diseases and bacterial diseases get into apple varieties that are not uh, genetically tolerant of those diseases. And gold rush is very genetically tolerant of the main diseases that we have here, a bacterial one called farblight and a fungal one called apple scab. So, so, and besides that, even better, it's one of the very best apples in terms of its eating quality and storage qualities that we have. Uh, so it's my favorite. Grimes Golden is an old-timey heirloom apple that's a summer apple that, that uh, is like the one that we have also grafted in another place on this farm. It's probably quite obvious that this limb right here needs to go beca because we want the sunshine to come in and give us a lot of exposure here uh, of sun for photosynthesis on this and on that one over there. So one of the limbs that needs to go for sure is to cut here. And I'm not gonna finish this cut because I don't like the saw that well with this saw. But now we've got it marked. So the other thing is we have this, only one graft to start it of Grimes Golden but it's over here on the very shady side of this tree. My opinion is that this part of the tree right here is the one that we should save for her and also to be the nurse for the rest of these limbs. But actually, we for sure don't need this piece of snag that's left here. And it would be better if we actually removed this whole thing right here, Pat. Is the Grimes Golden actually alive or did it die? That's a good question. And before we get busy and cut it away, we should check that. And the way we check it is by making a little nick in the side to see if the bark is alive. It's dead. So we are not gonna to have to worry about trying to protect this. Now the, now the question is, are we going to graft a, another variety in to replace the Grimes Golden that we didn't like very much anyway? Pat has Granny Smith, a well-received uh, apple with all greens, uh, skin and late maturing and it will pollinate gold rush. He doesn't have the budwood here to graft, graft it tonight. So the same kind of graft that we've just demonstrated on, on a crabapple tree is the kind that he will use. He, he'll he will split this tree someplace. And my advice to him is not to split it down here where the, where the bark is so thick and the limb is so thick. It's better to come up about to this height to make, to make the graft. I have some ribbon that I'm gonna put on there to mark the place that I want Pat to, to put the top work graft in, in this tree. So he has to do the work and I don't want to get it so high that it's difficult that he has to get a ladder to do it. So any place between here and here, Pat. As long as it's a very different apple, it'll be a good pollinator for the other ones, right? That's a good generalization, not completely accurately true. The point is that, that we do need two apple trees to make apples and the bees have to move the pollen between the two. But some apple trees are cousins and they're so close to each other that they both are, are so near each other that they won't pollinate the other one. You have to have enough difference genetically. I will run by what I have to you. You'll tell me what's good and then she can pick from that. That'll be good, that'll be good. All right, so he's gonna cut this right off and he's gonna split it and he's gonna put two limbs in to inside the bark. And uh, we're going to hope that whatever he puts in there, when he tops it off with wax and seals it, yeah, well, and he's getting better and better at doing this. So he doesn't, he's, I'm, I'm getting, working myself out of a job. I have lots more jobs for you. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Pat, for having me here. We'll keep you employed. Okay. So I bred some varieties of cherries when I was at Cornell. And one of them's name is White Gold. And unlike the, in the apples, where they won't pollinate themselves, white gold was bred and selected especially to be a nice white flesh variety with a red cheek on the outside, but one that's self-fertile. 
the bees just work on the tree without having to go over there and get something and bring it over here. So this limb is one that we did two years ago. Yeah. And it, it's going to have, should have, some flowers. We had one flower last year. Did it. Yeah. So the first flowers that a tree like this has are always in the first two or three places where they start to grow out from the side of a limb. So I can tell that this is a flower bud right here, and this one is, and this one is. This one might not be, but these first three right here are flower buds that are going to come out. And the, the bee will visit them and transfer the pollen from the little tiny filament with the pollen in it to the tip of the, uh, it looks like a needle, that they put it on the tip of it. It's called a pistil. And when the bee transfers it there, then the next thing that has to happen, that pollen has to grow down through that needle-like thing to the egg that's in the bottom of it. And the two combine to make a seed, and the seed has the flesh grow around the seed for a cherry. So Pat last year was trying his hand where we split the limb, put the branch in, I think you got the branch from here, didn't you? Yeah, we took it. Yeah, you came over and cut it. I said, shouldn't we get it before it starts getting too warm? And you cut it. Yeah. And yeah. So, so we started the refrigerator to keep it dormant. And then he came out here and split the limb and cut it like we showed you, a wedge shape with it's wider on the outside and narrower on the inside and wedged it in there. And, and it's just, it's taped and covered with wax like we've just shown. And it grew. Well, about two feet, and this one's grown, got close to two and a half feet on its two. This one has three different buds that broke, so it's not quite as long as that, but I'd say it's even stronger than that one. And so now Pat is faced with the question of, should he leave this nurse limb and this nurse limb from the flowering cherry tree on this for another year? Of course, if he does, that means that everything up there will have to have the resources from the roots, but also it will make a lot of photosynthesis and things that are coming back to help these. That's his question. Should, should I or should I not cut these off? And my opinion is that he should cut this one off and leave this one. Okay, so I cut it off above the graft, of course. Yeah, yeah, just cut it right there. Well, then I'm taking off one of the grafts. Oh, no. No, you're not. I, what about the next one? Oh, I didn't see that, Pat. That you, oh, when you said two graphs, you meant four graphs. See that central leader kind of thing that's it's not, at, not the biggest one, but the one that kind of comes back this way? There are three, three up there that are fairly big. The smallest of the three, it comes back this way, should be cut out of there. All of this, magic. <laughs> I called it magic for this reason. We don't know when scientists figured out that there is a cambium. But we know long before that, in biblical times or before, people saw that when two limbs rubbed together of the same tree, they some, if they were pressing together, they, their cambiums could come in contact with each other and they could make a natural graft within the same tree. And surely that's probably how early uh, people of the genus Homo <laughs> the upright primates, that's how they figured out that grafts work. They didn't know there was a cambium in there. They only knew that it worked. Right, but it took some careful observation to line up the cambiums. Well, to go to the next step of deducing that you could cut a limb and put it in and that that would work too, that's a very ingenious thing so that some very clever person, maybe not as clever as Isaac Newton. Next year when the wood is dormant, I'm thinking some of my branches that have taken will be pruned, right? So I love what you did here to tie it down. What he's doing there by tying it down is he, he knows from my coaching and from other things that he's had by other educators that have come to Living Web Farms, that if you make a more lateral branch instead of one that's trying to reach the sky like a forest tree, if you make a more lateral branch, it makes more flowers and those flowers are more apt to set fruit instead of make vegetative growth in wood by going up. And and all forest trees have so much competition that they, their tendency is to have their apical dominance take them up to the sunshine. And this cherry tree that's sitting here alone with all of this vigor, if he didn't tie it down, 
It tends to also want to go up and make a forest tree to get up to the sunlight. Now, it happens that it has enough exposure that it doesn't have to go up like a forest tree. He wants it to fruit as soon as possible. So by tying it down, it's, it's, it's increasing the probability that it will set flower buds and that also that it won't be so vigorous in the amount of wood that it makes. After the cherries from the previous season are formed, the sun hitting the buds of the new growth tells that the buds that are there that they should have flower primordia for the following season inside of them. So the flowers for next year are going to get formed about the middle of June of 2018 and they're going to rest inside of the bud until next year. And that bud is at the base of every leaf. Pat did good. I didn't talk with him at all about tying the plant down, but he learned from somebody else. Well, I ran it by you and you said it's fine to do. Oh, you know? oh I yeah, didn't yeah, remember yeah, that. Yeah, Thanks, yeah. Pat. Um, but also, should we ex should we be slicing off the tape that was on those? Oh, it does, it's essentially disintegrating, but it's not doing anything. It's not it's not needed. Yeah, so it can it can be removed. The, the wax and the tape are superfluous now. And then come the end of this year's growth, we'll either remove some of the branches that have grown off, or once again weave them together. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One yeah. more year's growth, and then we'll. Yeah, well, it's, you you happen to have a nice distribution here of this for, of this two mm -hmm. two year old one yeah. that's now it going to be in its third leaf. And this tree, by the way, will be coming down because it's competing, but I'm saving it. I won't take it down until June because our friend Mira Mira Brown makes poplar bark baskets from it. Oh, and so that may look like not a very big piece of bark, but because the poplar bark is like has a um, football shape cut in the bottom and then it's bent up, it'll be twice as big as that, so it'll make a pretty big basket. So that's a tulip poplar. Yeah. If I tried to cut it now, she couldn't use the bark. It has to be when the bark is slipping uh -huh. and she can take it off. Which I, is about a month from now. Yeah, and so that's when this thing will get taken out. But I might actually, I don't know, probably I can just tie this to here then, you know. Um, tie it to the fence. Yeah. Thank you to you, Pat. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go see if you got tiny as a boy like that. Thank you, folks.